Hello. Uh, 1984 was a lovely year. We had a beautiful summer and we had a very fine spring. And as a result of that, it's been a good year for the harvest. And it's been a good year for the harvest of wild things as well, things that grow in the hedgerows, berries, nuts, fruits, and different kinds of mushrooms. And I haven't been wasting the opportunity that this offers. I've been out picking them, spending a lot of time doing it. That's why I'm wandering around the countryside carrying buckets. And what I want to do is to show some of the different edible things that you can find in the hedgerows, uh, go around, show you what they look like, how to pick them, and also how to prepare them into things that are good to eat. The first thing I found when I came into this field was elderberries. This is a, quite a nice elder tree, and the berries are in absolutely perfect condition. You can tell when elderberries are ripe because the bunches of berries tend to, to hang down a little bit with the weight of the ripened fruit, and they get this lovely shiny black color. There's lots of things you can do with elderberries, lots of different things you can make. So I'm going to pick a few of these and take them into the kitchen and prepare a few good things out of them. The other thing I found along this hedgerow pretty soon are sloes. These are sloes. They're little blue fruits, the fruit of the blackthorn tree. They look very nice, but in fact, they're incredibly bitter. And they take the enamel off your teeth. But you can use them if you prepare them properly for various different foods and drinks. The sloe is, in fact, the ancestor of all our domestic plums. They're all bred by horticulturalists from the bitter little thing you find in the hedgerows. And some years they're much better than others. This year is a particularly good slow year, and it's because the plant, the blackthorn, flowers very, very early. Its white blossom comes <laughs> often early in March. I think the dog's found a rabbit. It comes very early in March, and we had a particularly fine spell of weather at that time, and the blossom was all fertilized. And we have a good crop this year to make the best of. Of course, the other berries which everybody knows about for picking are blackberries, the fruit of the bramble. Very common berry e all over the country and even in city suburbs. It's a bit late in the year for picking blackberries, but the, all the superstitions that say that they're actually poisonous or bad for you if you pick them after a certain date aren't in fact true. They're not based on scientific fact. Just the blackberries get a bit squashy, and they're better used for things like jams and jellies rather than things like tarts and pies and this kind of thing. But the blackberries are still there, they can still be picked, and they can still be used. Of course, these berries and fruits and things aren't the only thing you can get from the hedgerow harvest at this time of year. There are lots of knots and leaves and things that you can eat, and there's also funguses, mushrooms, things like that. So what I'm going to do next, having got a few berries in my bucket, is try and see if I can get a few different edible funguses in the other bucket out here in the field. I'm getting a few. There's quite a few mushrooms here. And these are all field mushrooms, the ordinary common species. Oops. I'm hoping to get a few other kinds over here, because I know there's more than one species in this field. These are puffballs. Puffballs are the safest funguses of all to eat, because there is no poisonous species of puffball in Ireland. And you can always tell them, because Unlike most mushrooms and funguses, they don't have the, the gills underneath. They're just a smooth, round ball. But although none of them are poisonous, they're not very good to eat unless they're young. And the only way to tell if they've gone too far to eat is to cut them in half with a knife. And that one has beautiful, firm, smooth, white flesh inside, and it's a perfect one for eating. On the other hand, some of them here look a bit dodgy. But this one here is a yellow soft in the middle, and that's not great for eating. But there's one fungus that's the real mushroom hunter's treasure, and that's the giant puffball, a rather rare puffball, much, much bigger than the ones before. I came across some here. There's a small one here, which is in perfect condition to, for eating, nice and firm, and an enormous one here. What I'm going to do with this weighs pounds is take it back into the kitchen, 
with all I can carry now. I'm prepared to eat. I'm really the problem with going out and picking all these things, which is great fun, is when you come back in, you have to then do something with them. There's a certain amount of work to be done in the kitchen, but at least I've got you to help me this time. <sighs> and what I want to do, what I want to start off doing is I want to make some of these fruit jellies, which are a very good thing to do with berries. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like jam making. It's just, in some ways, it's easier than jam making. And I've already um, started cooking some of the berries. Blackberries, these blackberries that we picked on their own don't make a very good jelly. They don't have the right stuff in them to gel. So what I do is I mix them with a few apples. These are just windfall apples that are picked up under trees. They're quite muddy, as you can see. Yeah. I washed them before. And I've just chopped up the apples. You don't have to peel or core them. I mix them with the blackberries and cook them for about half an hour in this pot here. It makes a great gooey mess as you can see in here. And we have to strain them so we can make the jelly out of them. Um, to strain them, we use a jelly bag. This is a jelly bag. You can make these or you can buy them. This is a bought one, made out of nylon, so they last much better than the old-fashioned muslin ones. And we have to put the pulp into the jelly bag and leave it to hang up when it drips out through, and the juice that drips through is what we make the jelly out of. And we'll have to leave it for a little while to drip. We can do a few other things while we're doing that. So would you give me a hand? Sure. Just <laughs> hold this. When you get a new, this is a new jelly bag. You see it's not stained, and you have to sterilize them first, so. How do you do that? What I did is I poured a kettle of boiling water through it. Now, I don't want this to splatter all over you. Can you hold it down a little yeah, bit? Yeah, okay. And we'll take it gently, because if it does splatter on you, it makes an awful stain. And you never get it out. It's real sludgy it's stuff. Gooey, yeah. Yeah. It smells nice, though, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You get the smell? Yeah, it's a lovely smell. Right. How do you actually hold it up? Do you have to tie it on something? Tie it with a bit of twine and hang it up. You can use it. You can hang it up under a table or something like that. That's most of it. I'll just scrape out the last little bits. It's very heavy. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. There's a few pounds. We've got a few blackberries there. As I said, about 50-50 blackberries and apples usually gives you a good jelly. So that's the last little bit's gone. Oops. Now what I'll do now is I'll just leave these. I'll take it from you. We leave that. It's best to leave it, if you can, even to leave it overnight, mm -hmm. dripping like that. Collect all the juice in the pan. You need a big pan, because as you find when we come to cooking it, it all froths up. And we'll go on and we'll deal with those mushrooms, and this will drip away while we're doing it. Okay. Well, Mary, the other thing we got yesterday was some giant puffballs. We got several of them. That's actually a small one, would you oh believe? Goodness. How big the, do they come? Well, the record, I believe, which was found recently was 36 pounds. And that's only, I'd say, a couple of pounds. But the young ones, you see how firm it is? The young ones are very good. Now, I'm going to try and cook that so you can taste it. What I've got here, it's, they're very simple to cook. What I've got here is breadcrumbs and a couple of eggs beaten up. And that's all you need. We cut the puff balls. You need a good sharp knife for this because they're not that easy to cut. And if you're young, you should possibly get somebody to do this part of it because otherwise you can slice your fingers off. See, they're quite nice mm, inside. It's lovely, yeah. It's like a sponge, uh, isn't it? Yeah, and it's got quite a nice smell. We cut a slice off, about as thick as a slice of bread, or a bit thicker, like that. Cut a piece. See, that knife's quite sharp, but it didn't even cut across it. Here's a piece for you. Now, what we have to do is dip our piece in the beaten egg get it nice and gooey, like that, and sticky, like that. Dip it in the breadcrumbs. It's a bit of a coating of breadcrumbs, like that. Mm -hmm. And I've got a pan of hot fat over here, like that. Bit of cooking oil, heating up. Drop it in, let it sizzle away. And in a couple of minutes' time, you'll be able to eat your first puffball, I hope. You have to cook it a little bit on one side. You've never eaten anything like this no, before? No, never. Just Are you worried? <laughs> well, it looks rather unusual. Well, do you usually eat them on their own, or would you eat them with something else? I usually eat them for breakfast, with rashers and eggs, um, fried up like this, like a bit of fried bread. Is that the only way you can cook them, or is there any other way? There are other ways, but it's the only way I've ever done them, and it's so good that I wouldn't change. Right. 
There you go. Okay. <laughs> Mm, it's very nice. Mm, what should I expect? Lovely. Mm.